Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Coach and Benway. I am your co-host, Dr. Benway. Coach is on the line. Say hello, Coach. Hello, Coach. And we are going to be talking about someone you know. You probably don't like her if you're our crowd, but let's let's be frank. She's kind of interesting. She's done a lot of interesting things. Meryl Streep. <laughs> there might, there's a great there's a great Simpsons line that's uh, they were advertising an, a, a a perfume called Meryl Streep's versatility, which was smell like Streep for cheap. And that, smell like <laughs> what? Can you repeat smell that? Like, smell like Streep for cheap. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that's the tone of mind I'm going to have going in. Interpret that as you will. So, uh, Coach, why is Meryl Streep fascinating to us? Um, She's hate watchable. (laughs) That's as simple (laughs) as that. You know, I I, I watch her and I feel this indescribable loathing, you know, uh, this this loathing for all her hypocrisy and her two-facedness and her lack of honesty in her acting and in her life. Uh, um, I, I, I truly loathe her. Um, okay, this is my, my thinking about it. I first noticed uh, Meryl Streep back when she did Kramer vs. Kramer. Now, um, yeah, I'm old enough to remember when that movie came out. And um, I actually saw it in the theater when it came out. And it was a very... Um, at the time, I thought it was a good movie. It was only much later that I realized it's a highly manipulative and rather dubious picture. Okay, I saw it when I was like 12 years old. Okay, Now, I noticed it because I was 12 years old, and I thought that Meryl Streep was really, really hot. Okay, and um, But she seemed very intense. She seemed like a damaged person in that movie. And, and so anyway, she's been around forever. She's gone, been nominated for Oscars up the wazoo for tons and tons of movies. But the thing that I have noticed about her over the years is that she tends to deliver... Um, big performances in weak movies. And it's almost as if she deliberately chooses to star in movies by people who are not very good um, so that she can uh, be outstanding in it. It's sort of like 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 being uh, in, in Lilliput, or what was the name of it? Lilliputia or whatever it was called. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's and, right. and, you know, the giant walking around the midgets. Okay. Now that's the later films because you look at the the beginning of her of her career, and she worked with some outstanding directors. Or let me phrase that: directors directors who at that time were doing really incredible work. For instance, uh, Michael Cimino did The Deer Hunter. Um, whatever you think of uh, Michael Cimino and 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 uh, uh, Gates of Heaven and 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 all the rest of it, uh, you know he was doing interesting work at the time. Okay, and he was working, and she worked with him. She worked with Woody Allen when he did Manhattan, arguably one of his three or five best pictures ever, you know. And he's done some remarkable pictures. Uh, you know, she worked with a bunch of really good people: um, uh, Alan Pakula, Mike Nichols. She worked with him two or three times. Uh, she yeah. did um, with Mike Nichols. She did Heartburn. She did. I'm looking at the at the list of her credits. She did Postcards from the Edge, and she did Silkwood. Um, in all None of, her- of which I think are actually great movies, but you know, she, th- her performances are the memorable parts of those movies. Well, Mike Nichols did capable pictures, but very few, if any great pictures. I, I, I honestly do not, they, they were all pictures that captured the zeitgeist, but they weren't pictures that were unforgettable. Manhattan, for instance, is an unforgettable picture, not merely because it was shot in black and white. Uh, but the, the style, the approach that Woody Allen had, his brilliant work with uh, Gordon Willis, uh, uh, you know, it, it just all came together and it created a great picture. Whereas Mike Nichols just did competent pictures. Silkwood is a very, very competent picture. It, you know, Kurt Russell has a great performance in it, uh, which is often overlooked because people forget that Kurt, um, Kurt Russell is a great actor. He just hasn't had the opportunity to show it. But th- the point I'm trying to make is that, see, it seems to me that Meryl Streep, in the early phase of her career, would attach herself to attach herself to great directors and do pictures that were fairly interesting. And then, as her career evolved, she started attaching herself to people who were less competent and capable than her, so as to deliver outsized performances that would be viewed as remarkable, in a Lilliputian sense. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, 
your perspective being different than I, you're old enough to kind of see her progression and, yeah. you know, notice how it evolved. I, I was born into her already being established. So I was born in the mid 80s and she had by that time already done, you know, she had already won an Oscar already mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. Sophie's Choice. And she had been in Out of Africa, Silkwood, Kramer versus Kramer, Manhattan, Deer Hunter, so on and so forth. Right. So I always, you know, had, saw her as like the grand poobah presence, like, oh, you know, the great actress and whatnot. And for me, you know, I, there are certain movies of hers that I liked, uh, even movies that I think in retrospect people think are kind of, oh, bland Hollywood movies, like Out of Africa is a movie I enjoy, but, in but, part because I... But uh, actually, that was the movie I was going to bring up. Sorry to interrupt, but it actually it points to my thesis. I think that Out of Africa was the inflection point when she started deliberately picking movies made by people who were uh, healthy mediocrities, Okay, so, so they weren't going to make her look bad. It wasn't going to be a catastrophic picture, but it wasn't going to be a great picture. Okay, and, and so she would be able to outshine these healthy mediocrities that she surrounded herself with because she worked with Sidney Pollack and uh, Robert Redford on Out of Africa, right? Now, Sidney Pollack, you know, he, he um, I, I love him for to Tootsie. Tootsie was a great picture. But frankly, uh, Tootsie was not because of Sidney Pollack. It was because of the incredible tension between the writers, Dustin Hoffman and Sidney Pollack, who all three groups wanted to kill one another. And that's what created and Tootsie. And Sidney Pollack, e Pollack wasn't even the first choice to direct. Hal Ashby was actually the first choice, but Hal was bombed out of his skull yeah. by the time he had yeah, to yeah, replace yeah. But, 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 but the point I'm trying to make is I, I don't mean to knock Sidney Pollack. And, and point of fact, I actually have a, a semi-relationship with the guy because he and uh, Anthony Minghella bought the last book I published uh, to make it into a picture of that Minghella was going to direct before he died. But anyway... Uh, the, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on the guy. On the contrary, I owe him a lot of money, actually. Uh, but the, the point I'm trying to make about Sidney Pollack is that he was not a great director. He was a very capable Hollywood director. He would deliver the goods. He was, he was a, a competent mediocrity. Now, when I say, uh, say that, it sounds so condescending to speak of such, a, of such a man because, you know, ultimately a director like Sidney Pollack, he's a very, very capable individual in managing a picture, directing a picture, a big Hollywood picture is an inordinarily complex task. He was able to do it competently, but not brilliantly, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I, would, I would call, okay. I'd say the word I'd use for that is he's a great jur journeyman filmmaker. By right. that, I mean he can technically get it what done what yeah. you need. He's not necessarily a visionary by any stretch of the term, but he's very professional. He got it done. And frankly, you know, out of Africa, that's a movie fucking Orson Welles wanted to make. Yeah, and yeah. And figure out how to do it. And Sidney Pollack managed to do it. Well, I, I, know, I, I question whether he managed to do it. It doesn't matter. But the, the point I'm trying to make is about, about Meryl Streep is that that was the movie, that, for me, when she deliberately started associating herself with second-tier people. She has never worked with a truly brilliant film director. I mean, somebody like uh, I, you and I argued about Kubrick. I'm not going to doubt that Kubrick was a brilliant director, okay? Uh, you know, she never worked with top-tier directors in terms of in terms of ability of artistic vision, somebody like David Lynch. I'm not talking about commercially successful directors like Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg is the, the most successful commercial director ever. But let's face facts, his artistic pinnacle, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that's uh, 40 years ago in his rearview mirror. You know, uh, uh, frankly, right. you know, he, he hasn't done something that spectacular. There have been occasional close to almost brilliant, like, you know, the first three quarters of Minority Report, for instance. But, you know... Uh, um, he, so the closest I'd say she ever came after that period was... Uh, there's three candidates in my mind, and I think there are reasons to say a few of those guys don't count uh, yeah. for a couple of reasons. So one, Babé Schroeder, famous French director. So that that's a lesser-known film of his. I don't include it. Wh which one did he uh, direct? And, so before and after. Which I don't even remember that? it. I don't even remember I that. have no fucking idea. Um... I actually There's, saw it, but uh, I don't remember it. So uh, one movie that I actually think is legitimately great, uh, but not for uh, Meryl Streep. She's just an effective secondary role is Spike Jonze's adaptation. Agree. I Completely agree. Great yeah. movie. Very great movie. And then the other movie where I think she is front and center and she's challenged by someone who actually knows what the fuck he's doing. And it became an interesting movie out of a bad book is The Bridges of Madison County. Yes. Agree. Uh, that's yeah. Clint, yeah, Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Since, Clint, Clint, Clint Eastwood was uh, at the peak as a director. And he adapted that brilliantly because I actually read that fucking piece of shit novel and it is a fucking piece of shit, okay? And Bridges of Madison County is just treacly and just saccharine and, ugh, you know, it, it's like, a, 
you know, eating, eating taffy with whipped cream and, and brown sugar on top. It's just horrible, right? But yeah, the and, movie and is the, fucking good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for, and for those who don't know it and want to know, the premise of the story is this. Uh, an Italian woman who's living in small town America, I think she's either living in Iowa or Illinois and on yeah. the border of those areas. Yeah. Madison County is where those famous yeah. covered, covered bridges Cow country. Are. Cow country. Yeah. Ex exactly. And uh, so her husband and her kids go away on a trip to like the county fair kind of thing. And they're gone for, I don't know, a couple weeks or a week at least. Yeah. And uh, so she's left alone to her own devices to think about her situation. And along comes Clint Eastwood, who's a photographer for National Geographic. And he wants to, um, you know, photograph the bridges and she's giving him a tour. And on the week that they're there, they have a relationship that builds up. And, you know, it's not like there's a massive earth shattering moving plot, but it's a good exercise, especially in Clint Eastwood's minimalist style yeah. to appreciate that relationship between a guy who you may have a passion for, but for, you know, reasons that are quite obvious, he's going to leave. He's not a long term thing. And a woman who, you know, maybe has her doubts or anxieties about where she is at any given point in time and decides, am I going to be here? Am I going to be elsewhere? What am I going to do? And has to make decisions through that. You know, these are, you know, the films are, you know, like, small scale stories you know but it's really sharply drawn and you get a you know a peek into the tone and flavor and texture of the past because i think that movie's supposed to take place in the 60s if i remember correctly yeah, yeah. she was a war bride she was from italy the character and uh, she was a war bride and she had her children with the with the husband that she had fallen in love with in italy and there's never the the contention that she had not genuinely fallen fallen in love with her husband they'd simply been married for 20 odd years or if not more and and but here's what's interesting about that picture. Okay, first of all, Clint Eastwood, um, when he decides that he's going to act brilliantly, he is a fucking brilliant actor. Uh, I can think of some some of his performances, not the obvious one, Unforgiven, which is brilliant, but I'm thinking of the one that came right after, A Perfect World, and um, Bronco Billy. Bronco Billy is, I think, one of the greatest pictures American movies ever made. It's a, an absurd and trivial comedy in certain regards, okay? And it is one of Glenn Eastwood's early directorial efforts. But thematically, conceptually, it is so American uh, of a group of misfits, of, of um, cast-outs, castaways, who decide to invent themselves a circus because that's what it is. You know? It's a Wild West show, a, a show yeah. that's literally 100 years out of date. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 it, and it's so cheerfully and, and, and unambiguously innocent. Okay, and and when he when they do the show at the end, and and they do the full show, and 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 Clint Eastwood is Bronco Billy, and he says, you know, to all the little boys and girls, don't forget to eat your cereal and say, do everything that mom and pop tells you to do. You know, it, it's a brilliant performance, brilliant picture, and and the thing is, see, Clint Eastwood is deadly as an actor because when he decides to be really really good at something at a, at a performance he's he strips everything away in in the in the dollars movies for Sergio Leone that's why it's so memorable because he deliberately went out and cut every single line he himself eliminated the lines if it, they were not really necessary and that's why the man with no name practically has no lines right he's right. a minimalist actor okay and in that picture Meryl Streep must have realized she, she was outclassed. Because Can I tell you a great story on this? Which shoot. So they're filming a scene where they have the emotional moment of confrontation between Meryl Streep and Clint Eastwood's character. Mm -hmm. And Meryl Streep remembers where, you know, Clint's having this scene and he's like emotionally breaking down. Clint's crying and he never cries on screen. Yeah. And, you know, when the film came out, Clint didn't show his face. On that scene it just had him having the the scene and you know they did not show that kind of like raw emotional expression that you felt it you intoned it through the film but you didn't see that cut and Meryl was like why didn't you show your face to the camera that would have been your grand scene scene and everything and you would have won this that and the other and one says no that's not what the story needed to have happened that wasn't what it was appropriate for the right. character right and in that moment I think that encapsulates everything. their attitude everything Clint was like, what's best for the story and what is the bare minimum necessity? Meryl Streep is, what accolades can you get? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ex that, that's a fucking really revelatory movement. I had never heard of that uh, anecdote before. I was actually thinking of something completely different. In, from the bridges of Madison, Madison County, there, uh, he's uh, the char his character, I forget the name of the uh, character, is uh, collecting flowers for her. 
you know, which is a you know lovely thing to do for a woman, right? And and she like watches him and says, "What are you doing?" Well, I'm collecting flowers for you. He says, and and she starts to laugh and and she says, "Those are poisonous," and, then, and he drops them. But how he drops them? He he just yeah, opens his hands and let them lets them fall out. He doesn't like throw them up in the air or throw them over his shoulder like in a big. No, it's just like just let let's go instantly. Just minimalist. Whereas her reaction. She starts laughing in a big way, you know. Yeah. It, it, She's like, "I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm having a laugh." You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually forget if they were poisonous or not, but uh, they that, weren't. She was, she was just making it up just to yeah. fuck with them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is a fine scene, but it it, it showed the, the 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 thing, you know, the 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 difference, the difference between it. and she she never acts with people who can outclass her. She always goes for the little mediocre pictures, the journeyman directors, as you call them, which is an accurate assessment. Yeah, because uh, please, I, I want to take back what I said about Cindy Pollack because that, that, that's just mean. It's a journeyman, you know, which is very respectable. Okay, it's perfectly respectable. On, on the contrary, it's admirable in many regards. But she never goes for broke. She's never going to work with David Fincher. David Fincher is going to push her to the fucking wall. She'll never work with for him ever, you know. Uh, shit, Jodie Foster had two Oscars in the bag, and she was willing to do Panic Room, you know, with with Fincher and and be pushed around by him. And 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 uh, well, that that picture it didn't really work, but that's a different problem. The, 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 what I'm trying to say is that see, um, Rick Linklater, uh, Richard Linklater, um, uh, 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 David Fincher, who other direct, which other directors are artistically untouchable that really will push an actor way outside their comfort zone. Yeah, so, I mean, there's very few left now. I would but certainly you know put David Lynch, yeah. David Lynch, yeah. He would just, yeah, look what he did with Naomi Watts, for crying out loud, in um, in Mulholland Drive, right? Right. A, a psychedelic, psycho, a psychotic psychedelia. That's basically what that fucking picture was. It was fucking brilliant. And for me, after that picture, I'm like, Naomi Watts is a fucking artist, okay? She, she is no longer an actress. She really earned it, you know what I mean? And, and that's would interesting because, that. like, yeah, exactly. Because Meryl Streep has literally made a career as you go down the list of films that are designed to win awards but not mm. be memorable. Yeah. So you know, the, the hours. Um, oh God, I hated that fucking picture. I hated that book, which won yeah. a Pulitzer Prize, and I hated that fucking picture. It was it was a boomer piece of shit. Okay. Well, I could. But I get that was another one of those movies. Again, speaking about the boomers, where I hated all of the main characters in there because all of the main characters, in their own way, shape, or form, treated their own depression as more important than the than the people around them, to the yeah. detriment of the people around them. So yeah. obviously, so it's you know, it's all rel based around like let's let me retell the story of Mrs. Dalloway from a different perspective. Let me tell a story from. Uh, um, yeah. Virginia Woolf writing it yeah. from a woman in the fifties reading it and basically kind of living it, and and then a woman from the contemporary time also kind of living it. And then Meryl Streep is the contemporary time. All of those women, except for Meryl Streep, I'd say of the three women, she's the least uh, evil to a certain extent. Yeah, all of them are like so. Virginia Woolf is self destructive to the point where she'll throw herself into the fucking river and put her husband Leonard Woolf uh, yeah. through stress uh, for the sake of it. Um, the middle character played by Julianne Moore. Um, abandons her child because yeah. oh, the 50s life was so hard yeah and that child which actually to, it makes no fucking sense by the no, way no it doesn't and that child rose up to be ed harris who's an author and everybody loves the author but he's suffering from AIDS and is completely depressed and he's friendly with meryl streep who's his agent and he kills himself uh, yeah. spoiling the fuck out of the movie yeah. uh, uh, so and again it's like meryl yeah. streep has to bear witness to a mother who Get, had so much disinterest and arguably contempt for her family, including that fucking child that she, I would say, yeah, she is kind of responsible for that suicide in no small way. And I just, again, it's, I have this situation where, and it doesn't even necessarily yeah, but, but, mean but, but hang on, second, hang on, hang on. I, I have to, I have to, you know, rein you in here because we're talking about the movie as opposed to her performance. Okay. So, so I want to focus more on her performance and I want to focus on, on two performances in particular, which you probably know with, with the same actor. Uh, the the actor is Jack Nicholson in Ironweed and mm. in um, what was the other one uh, Heartburn. Oh okay. shit! They were one after the other. It, I just now realized. Okay, they were in eighty six and eighty seven. Heartburn was eighty six. Ironweed was eighty seven. Okay, so background. Both books, uh, b both movies rather, are based on books. Heartburn is based on the um, the semi uh, the Romana Clef written by what's her name Nora Ephron. Nora Ephron. How was like marriage to, being Carl, married to Carl Bernstein? Carl Bernstein. Right. 
And Ironweed is the book written by this uh, Irish guy. Um, oh, what's the name of the, the, the guy? Oh, he slips my mind. But uh, uh, William Kennedy? William Kennedy, yeah. Ironweed is a pretty good book. Okay, and um, anyway, the, the point of Ironweed... Okay, the, the point I'm trying to make is as follows. Look, Jack Nicholson basically um, is two actors in one. People don't understand him, but it's really easy to understand him when you look at it from this paragraph, from this heuristic. See... On the one hand, Jack Nicholson is da 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 Jack, you know, like the Jack Nicholson with the big smile, the Jack Nicholson mm -hmm. of, of Witches of Eastwick, the Jack Nicholson, the Jack of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the Jack of um, Witches of Eastwick, or... or, or, or yeah, all the big performances. Right, yes. the big performances. But then there's Jack Nicholson, the character actor, who's a different beast altogether. That's the guy of Ironweed. That's the guy of... Um, Chinatown. Uh, Chinatown. That's the guy of Terms of Endearment. Now, that's an interesting performance, by the way, because in Terms of Endearment, you think that he's playing Jack, da 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 da, -da Jack, but it's a facade. It's actually, I think, a self-referential critique of himself, okay? Because, and, and you realize this, in, in Terms of Endearment, when he goes to that cheap motel with that indoor pool to visit mm -hmm. Shirley MacLaine... And he's in his glasses, and you see who he really is. Just a paunchy, middle-aged guy who couldn't make the relationship with the woman work because he's just too selfish and lonely and, and sort of like oddly content in his loneliness, okay? The, the astronaut facade, the Jack, the one at the restaurant, that was a facade. And, and that little scene it proves it, okay? And you realize that the, that the whole performance of Terms of Endearment uh, he was he was not never Jack, you know, the movie star. He was Nicholson, the character actor. You see, and yeah. and uh, I want you to to keep this dichotomy in mind because in those two consecutive movies, Heartburn and Ironweed, you get both. You get Jack, the movie star, in Heartburn, and you get Nicholson, the character actor, in Ironweed. Okay, and in both, he eats her alive. He eats up Meryl Streep and spits her out. She can't compete with him, not like Shirley MacLaine could, for instance. Right. You, you see what I'm trying to say? No, I do, and 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 and, the, and it's not surprising that Shirley MacLaine came from the period where she cut her chops with you know Jack Lemmon and the likes of that. So she, she you know, yeah, much she better. could she could compete. But what was interesting and, was that in Heartburn, you look at the character that Meryl Streep is playing, and you look at Jack Nicholson, and you realize, of course, he's going to leave her because she's fucking boring. Okay. Well, isn't this is the other thing I got from Meryl Streep? Like when I, so I actually, I when I go to see a Jack Nicholson performance, and admittedly I seek them out. Sure. Um, I don't. It's not often that I go there for the sake of saying like, oh, how is Jack going to, uh, you know, impersonate this guy? I want to see what he's going to do with it. Whereas yeah. Meryl Streep, it's always like, how is Meryl Streep going to, you know, play Julia Child? And it's always like, how is the known quantity of Meryl Streep going to slightly amplify up or down to be, you know, some known figure? Like mm -hmm. Julia Child, you hear Meryl Streep's like, we're going to flip her pancakes and we're going to make a good mood about them. And say, yeah, they, okay, so she's doing the accent again. Yeah. Or when she does, when she did and won an award for playing Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. You know, oh, it, which you is know, basically you know, Julia Movie. Child accent. It's her Julia Child movie. accent, a little different. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're biopic movies. They're very boring and bland. And but it's a known quantity. You get to see Meryl Streep be Meryl Streep. Um, Jack, even though when he is a star and you know brings Jack to the table, he still successfully does what an actor does, which is to be the chameleon inside the role. The role takes over Jack. Well, actually, I would I would venture to say that Matt Damon is the second to none in that category. Because you, you look at Matt Damon, and in every role that he plays, he's superficially Matt Damon. You know, he, he, sometimes he doesn't even bother to change his haircut from movie role to movie role. He always looks the same. <laughs> but there's something inside him. He is able to change a switch inside him where, where the vibe, the essence that's emanating from him changes radically from picture to picture. I always think of Syriana, and I compare him to, to that performance there to Stuck on You, and then I mm -hmm. compare it again to... Um, the Good Shepherd. The, the Good Shepherd. Well, that was a horrible picture. Uh, no, I disagree. I think that's a good good movie. Well, but okay. this is a... be, be that as it may. Okay, but y you see what I'm trying to aim for. He he has this ability to internally just change the dial, so that even though on a superficial level, he's always the same guy. Inside, it's like another man, like like a different soul. Whereas with Meryl Streep, 
you have the opposite problem. It's always Meryl Streep pretending to be somebody else. And you're always aware that she's pretending to be some, somebody else. And worse still, she wants you to know that she's pretending to be somebody else. Yes. The best way to describe it, Meryl Streep is an actor who will put on the smear of makeup and, oh, it's Meryl Streep looks different, but it's a facade that's changed. With guys like Nicholson and Matt Damon, as you said, it's an internal change that happens, which is the where the talent comes from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's why I had to make the distinction, by the way, between Jack, the movie star, and Nicholson, the character actor. Because when, you know, when it's Jack, the movie star, like, for instance, The Departed performance, it was fairly embarrassing, I thought. Um, I agree, actually. It, it, was, it was kind of like, oh, man, we've seen this shit before we saw it in Batman, and you did it better then than now, you know what I mean? And, and yeah, I think and there's was, a certain degree where you I, have I, to accept that uh, actors after a certain age kind of just phone it in at yeah. a certain point. I yeah. even think Meryl Streep arguably has hit that stage, to your point, much earlier than most. Uh, it's just that people still think it's actually something more substantial than it really is. Yeah, because, like, for instance, I think about uh, the movie about Schmidt, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, a horribly bad movie um, where, where Nicholson gifted the, the movie one of the most brilliant performances ever. I mean, he truly was, like he yeah. had replaced his soul with somebody else, some totally random guy from Iowa, you know? I mean, look at, remember when he's like like lying in bed and like looking over the shoulder of his wife? It Complete, was, like, shlame, like all of the coolness, because Jack is, Jack the, is cool. in many Jack's ways, cool. the epitome of cool. Yeah, and he is not cool in that movie. He's a fucking schlub. And to me, I think the best scene, yeah, that when he's looking at his wife, um, his you know his actual wife in the movie, and then when he's like also in the hot tub with Kathy Bates, <laughs> it's, it's just, you're just like two two old timers like fuck all. We're not even gonna impress anyone anymore. Yeah. You know, and he's awkward and because like Jack it, around women is not awkward. No, knows, he's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even even you know, fat and seventy ish, he's cool. You know, there's something about the guy. You know, he'll always mm -hmm. be cool. But the, the thing about um, Meryl Streep is, yeah, that's the issue. issue. She wants the accolades. She wants the validation, okay? She doesn't want to explore a, ficti a fictional character. She looks at it as a job. She really, she is a, a it's, she's like a journey, your, your word, a journeyman um, actor, a great journeyman actor, but not an artist. Not even close. Do you think like there was a time because I, I, I have a feeling this happened. I'm this is me reading into her brain. So, you know, to be fair, this is just working with what I've seen. Do you think she hit a point where she said, whether I phone it in or whether I really do it, me getting an Oscar can happen just as quickly, so why bother? No, no, I think it's totally no, totally different. Totally, totally different. No, totally different. I, I view as look at her trajectory. She went to um, a good college. Uh, where'd she go to school? Um, she was a Yale drama student, I think. Yeah, yeah, Yale drama, but like uh, undergrad was like. Um, she, oh, it was she, one of the Seven Sisters, I think. Yeah, she she was she was raised in Summit, New Jersey. That's Vassar. Upscale, she went to Vassar. Yeah, but she Summit, New Jersey, is an upscale town. I, I I know people in that town. It's an upscale, big houses, rich people. Okay, and uh, where'd she go? She went to um, Vassar College and then Yale. Yeah. Okay. So so what's that tell you? She she's she was always the brightest girl in her class. You know, the bright, compliant girl, okay? Girls are all compliant, okay? Uh, never forget that. And, and when they are not compliant, you know, they're slutty, but they're also more interesting, you know? And look at Deborah Winger, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but, okay, so Meryl Streep always got ahead by being the, the best in the class, the most compliant girl, the one who made all her teachers happy. You know, that's how she got into Vassar. That's how she got into Yale. Of course, she has a degree of talent and, and certainly a degree of hard work, but there's no true brilliance. That's the thing. She confuses, she makes people, uh, uh, I think she works hard, okay, at her performances, but her motivation, it's to make other people happy and to get the little gold star, the little gold medal, the, the little golden statuette. It's not as an end in itself. And that's the difference. That's the difference between a true artist and somebody who's just a professional, a very good professional, but not an artist. And I'm trying to go back and see like those earlier films where you know I think there's more meat to them. Like, is there any film where she literally carried that was great? And I know people are going to probably try to say Sophie's Choice, but honestly, there's something missing in that. And I think it's even though I think the book is very strong. 
and I think the concept of the film very interesting. There's something about it which seems hollow. And the best way I could describe it, it looks my mother's a Polak. My mother mm -hmm. speaks Polish. She can write it and read it. She just sees through Meryl Streep in that role. She's like, that is a phony, you know, Polak performance. I don't trust her. My mother's probably never liked her since then. <laughs> so so I think there I think to your point, there's gotta be something about that because she's even those other great movies that she's in, she doesn't carry the movie. She supports it. She's effective in it, but she doesn't carry them. Deer Hunter, she's a minor player. Manhattan, very minor player. Uh, Kramer versus Prayer, effective, you know, supporting actress. I think she won an Oscar for it, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, not the not the thrust of the movie. And I don't even think it's a great movie. French Lieutenant Woman. Now that's an interesting one because I, liked I think it. I, I, I liked it too, and, and that's because I like uh, the author of the book and also Harold Pinter, who wrote the the screenplay. John, it's a John Fowles book, and it's a very kind of regional specific UK uh, film. It's like around like Hampshire and Dover, but uh, you know that's not you know that's one out of God knows however many films she's made, and it's a weird uh, kind of experimental film almost. Which yeah, is, it really is. But I, but for instance, I think that Jeremy Irons is better than she is. Oh, for sure, no doubt. Yeah, he, he his character is more interesting, and and her character in French Lieutenant's Woman is oddly flat in, in both roles, both as the French Lieutenant's Woman and as the actress playing the French Lieutenant's Woman, right? Uh, um, it, it was, yeah, you'd act, uh, you know, I, I, we, we're not going to get into the description of French Lieutenant's Woman. It's it's a worth, it's a picture worth worth watching, uh, but like for instance, you know, she's actually very good in some comedies. Or, or let me phrase yeah. that: the comedies that she's been in, I personally liked. I like She Devil. Okay. Uh, and the Devil Wears Prada, I thought she's actually affected. That she yeah, that and, and Death Becomes Her also. Uh, more oh, yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. That yeah. was a legitimately great, well, you know, it's a good, solid Hollywood uh, genre picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Robert Zemeckis. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. nothing, nothing wrong with that. It was, it was a good genre picture, another journeyman picture, okay? Uh, technically difficult at the time. It was extremely difficult to make because that was, you know, bleeding edge in so far as, uh, um, what do you call it, um, uh, special, effects, special effect. Yeah. What year was that? That was ninety two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember that and picture when it really came out. The performance that really sells that movie for me is actually uh, another guy who never gets the credit uh, for, which is Bruce Willis. Bruce oh Willis yes, Bobby. Uh, old brilliant, guy, old guy. brilliant. Bruce, no. Willis, Bruce Willis is an amazing actor, very similar to Kurt Russell in that you know he never gets the full credit he deserves. And remember, yeah, we think of him as action star, uh, you know, diehard, but Bruce Willis got his chops in a TV show called uh, Moonlighting. Moonlighting, yeah, where it's basically like Audrey and Hepburn, you know, Tracy, you know, and Hepburn, yeah, uh, kind of uh, quick repartee, dialogue, kind quick of thing, repartee. Yeah. He's very funny, he, he's a fundamentally a comedian at heart, yeah, and that's why the his action films kind of sell because he brings that to the table. Yeah. Never got enough credit for it, and he's the he steals the movie for as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah, yeah. Meryl Streep is best is effective in it. And Meryl, the funny thing is, Meryl Streep plays like a a horish star who's about like being you know young and beautiful and recognized and everything. It's like the perfect role for her because it's probably not that far removed uh, from the truth. Uh, and, you know, and Goldie Hawn gives a decent performance, but it's it's you know other people are really driving the movie, not her. Yeah, uh, she's um, she's actually kind of funny in, in playing like a, uh, what was the name of the the uh, character in in um, Sunset Boulevard? What's her name? Oh yeah, yeah uh, she's playing a variation of that, and yeah, a yeah. self conscious variation of that, and it works very well. Um, but but Bruce Willis is far and away the best character in the picture, uh, far far and away. And that what's interesting is that see at the end of that that picture there is a, a sequence where they're at his funeral. Many years pass after the events of the movie uh, uh, because it's basically Bruce Willis's 50-year-old uh, crisis, midlife crisis. And events happen and what have you, and he escapes from these horrible women, right? And, and what happens at the end is that he's, um, it's, it's his funeral. And the man giving the eulogy for, for his character, Dr. Manville, is, um, is describing how he lived after you know, and what's interesting about Bruce Willis's performance is that it's so strong that as you listen to the man eulogize him, you imagine very clearly and directly how that life must have played out. Okay? Exactly. It, it, it's a very, very strong performance. Um, or let me phrase that. The, the force of his performance is such that you can clearly imagine him in something, in some other thing. And by the way, this reminds me of something totally off topic, but I just want to touch it because I thought it was so brilliant. When uh, Ang Lee in Life of Pi used mm -hmm. Gerard Depardieu as the cook, the, the sequence of where, when he's the cook in the, sh in the boat, in the ship, is maybe less than 30 seconds long. It, it's not more than that. 
And yet it's, it's that performance of the cook that later at the end of the movie, the boy is telling what happened after the ship sank, right? And you're realizing mm-hmm. that the whole movie of Life of Pi, of him being stuck on a boat with a tiger, was an allegory, right? Um, and, and he's describing what actually happened of how the cook uh, killed his mother, right? Uh, mm. it, it, did, you, did you ever see Life of Pi? Am I giving it away? Uh, no, no, no. You, you don't have to worry about spoiling it for me. Yeah, I, I saw large segments of it. And I, it was one of those interesting movies where I'm like – there's every so often it's a movie where I superficially when I hear about it, I'm like that can't be interesting mm-hmm. but when I see it it like surprises me yeah well well the thing is see what was interesting about that that monologue at the end of the picture that the boy gives is that it all centers around the Ger- Gerard Depardieu character who is in the picture less than 30 seconds in a single trivial scene but it's so like you know he's so magnetic even if you don't know who Gerard Depardieu is his persona, his memorable. actor, the the force of his personality is memorable enough, and and Ang Lee was shrewd enough to use him in that way. That when this long monologue, because the monologue takes like about ten minutes or something, five to ten minutes is a long monologue describing all of these incidents, right? Um, you clearly visualize uh, uh, what you call it um, um, that actor, right? That that man playing it, that character. Mm-hmm. But you see. Whenever you hear of something about involving a character that Meryl Streep is playing, you think not the character. You think Meryl Streep. Okay. Yes. Okay. And like, for instance, the Miranda Priestly thing in Death, um, you know, uh, Devil Wears Prada, it's always Meryl Streep in, in frosty hair and, and a highfalutin tone. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's like, and, and you remember, you, you think to yourself, you notice the acting. If you're noticing the acting, there's slightly something askew. And that's why I think her, a lot of her films aren't great. Like I said, people say, oh, you know, didn't she do a great, like, uh, like I said, Margaret Thatcher accent. Didn't she do a great, um, Julia Child accent. And, and by the way, speaking of accents, people think she's, she loses herself in roles. I'm like the accent she, she used in the accent she used in Sophie's choice out of Africa and uh, the bridges of Madison County are the same fucking accent, just slightly <laughs> tweaked. Yeah. You know, it's her, as I refer to it, it's the Meryl Streep generico Europeo. Accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like for instance, I'm looking at a more recent picture doubt the one where she plays that um, awful nun. Right. And I kind of, I kind of liked that one, but it's not like a memorable. One. I saw it once. I said, "Okay, that was good," and I never thought about it again. Again, a mediocre picture. Yeah, fantastic, Mr. Fox. I enjoy well enough, but uh, her never role is never minor, minor. Yeah, I never saw it. Uh, it's complicated. Which one was that? I don't even. I don't even think I saw that one. Uh, American Romantic. Oh, it's with she's in. She's in. I see in the poster. She's in bed with Alec Baldwin and Alec Keith Baldwin Martin's was the best thing about that picture. He was fun. <laughs> he was a lot of fun, you know? I mean, like, when, when Alec Baldwin decides to not give a fuck and just, like, have fun with a role, he is just adorable, you know? And I mean that, I mean that in, a, in, a, in a non-gay, you know, very affectionate no, manner. No, 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 you know? no. I, I get exactly. Is this why his role in 30 Rock is so fun? Yeah. He's just, fuck it. Fuck it. I'm just going to be this crazy guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, like, okay, Meryl Streep and the Iron Lady, that was just, you know... Oscar bait again, and it was a horrible movie because the thing is, see, they, they didn't, they, they wanted to belittle her, and so they made her, you know, they showed her when she was senile, okay, for to no real effect because politically, I, uh, Margaret Thatcher is a non starter with the kinds of people who would make these movies, and yet it's so obvious that she changed, she was a force of history, right? Whether right. you like her or not, she well, uh, what's annoying about it is they reduced all of Margaret Thatcher to women in power, and hey, we still get a jab at her because she's a senile old yeah. coot in the movie. Whereas, like, you no, know, you know, that kind of un you know, it kind of minimizes what Thatcher did. Yeah. You know, all they did was just recount, you know, hey, let's have a summary recount of what she did. They didn't take time, like, I think a good comparison point would be a movie like uh, The Deal. Uh, you know, or the Queen, you know, that was written by uh, Peter Morgan. You know, so the I deal despise is, him, but okay, I know you despise him, but those are successful movies. So what, yeah, the yeah, deal, the deal is especially, about, yeah, yeah, the deal is like there's a period of time in the Labour Party when they, you know, the leader was trying to figure out how. Who was going to be the leader, leader of the Labour Party? It was either going to be Tony Blair or Gordon Brown. And there was these two guys just meeting at dinner to figure that out. And you go into their whole history of like yeah. why they were friends and why they don't get along with each other. But you take a microcosm and you expand it. And from there, you explore the richness of the character, which is a different way of kind of going moment by moment, history by history, every last thing they did. And it's just like to tick the 
block the check marks. You don't learn anything about the character. Yeah. Again, another example, one that was good is the movie, The Queen, which ultimately became the impetus for the show I kind of enjoy watching as of now, which is The Crown, which is Queen Elizabeth at the death of Princess Diana and how she handled it and what her handling of the situation was against uh, what the country wanted to her. And Helen Mirren gave a much better performance. Again, Helen Mirren didn't in necessarily just reproduce all the little details of uh, Queen Elizabeth II, although she captured a bit of it, but it was all about the, in, you know, capturing that inner essence of what it was to be Queen Elizabeth. And, you know, Meryl Streep was more like, oh, I have the hair and I have the voice and I'm going to do these things and da 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 da. It's like, no, you didn't get Margaret that. Yeah, well, you don't it, know it, Margaret it, that. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, um, you know, that famous crack. I mentioned it to you the other day, the, the famous crack that Heath Ledger made at the Oscars when, when uh, he was up for Best Actor for Brokeback Mountain and uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman was up for Best Actor for um, uh, uh, Capote. And, um, you know, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman won and Heath Ledger, uh, clearly a little bit pissed off, said, I thought it was the award for best acting, not most acting, which, <laughs> which I thought was yeah. devastating, right? That's the thing. Helen Mirren goes for best acting. Uh, uh, Meryl Streep would go for most acting. Most little yes. ticks that fit people's preconceptions. Uh, whereas, you know, it, it's sort of like, um, you ever see um, Picasso once? I saw him uh, paint a bull on a pane of glass, right? The, the pane of glass was between the camera and himself. And, mm -hmm. you know, with like a single line of a paintbrush, you know, and he was an old man at the time. It was like an advertising. Right. It, it, a single line, he, he drew like the hump and like the, the top of the head and the horns of a bull. That was it. It was a single line and you saw the bull. It, it, that was enough. You know, he didn't need to do more. You know, he just drew this line, uh, you know, on the pane of glass between the, between the audience, the camera, right, and himself, who was staring right at the camera. And he just drew this line, and it started with like the tail, the hump of the back, the curvature of the back, then the hump of the shoulders, then the, that, that odd little hump that bulls have that goes down to his head, and then the little flick of the wrist, and he did the horns, right? It was a single fucking line, at least in my memory. And it was perfect, right? That is true artistry, okay? Uh, and you, you simply like do a little motion, and you see it. But she's just about adding detail. You yes, know? that's right. The the that's the thing, and it and it bleeds into other things she does because art, in many ways, is not so much what you add as much as what you take away or what do right. you, you subtract. left with the bare essence of it. You yeah. subtract more. She's always adding another layer of makeup, and eventually it cakes on and it cracks and it becomes overbearing, and it bleeds into things above and beyond her acting too. She's overbearing when she talks about anything. Yes, remember we're, we're, yes. You know, everybody's going to be aware of her when she says, "I have things to say about you know Donald Trump and this, that, and the other." It's much like her acting she lays it on too thick yeah okay so now let's go into the personal aspect the thing that i despise about meryl streep is that look i worked in hollywood in the 90s okay and you know early lesson okay everybody knew that harvey weinstein was a fucking pig everybody knew that the fucker never paid the money that he owed writers and everybody knew that if you're an actress okay he was going to try to fuck you actually what he preferred is to get the girls to give him blowjobs he he was obsessed with like standing over a pretty girl watching her give him give him a blowjob that was his thing okay and everybody knew what kind of girl he liked he liked the hitchcock blonde that icy uh, um high goyim blonde from preferably from new england or that kind of germanic background dutch germanic okay uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but you just uh, look at who won Oscars for Best Actress back in the 90s for middling performances at best. Uh, why do you think that happened? Okay, because uh, she got her off. She got him to come twice in a single session. You know, that's what it happened. You had girls who would appear on the cover of Vanity Fair who hadn't done fucking anything. And weren't very good actresses even, but they gave great blowjobs. Okay, right. that was the reality of Harvey Weinstein. Meryl Streep knew about this shit. If I was like a fucking nobody, okay, with no fucking contra contacts in the industry, I was like low level, you know, a few jobs here and there, a few, uh, you know, uh, option deals here and there, nothing special. Even I fucking knew that. And I'm like fucking, you know, retarded insofar as that kind of stuff, you know? I was dumb enough to think that, you know, the quality of writing gets you gigs, right? But anyway, <laughs> even I knew that that was a score with uh, Harvey Weinstein, 
Okay, every actress I ever met out there, every girl who's struggling to make it that I met out there, they would laugh and 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 make jokes about Harvey Weinstein and and stuff like, uh, oh, don't go to a hotel uh, with with a guy, you know, unless he's Harvey Weinstein, then you might get a role, you know. It would be like a running joke, and this is like fucking 95, 96, okay? So bullshit she didn't fucking know. And then the whole Me Too movement, and she jumps on that fucking bandwagon. What a fucking hypocrite. What a fucking cunt of a woman. Because she was buddy buddies with, um, with Harvey Weinstein, and she knew. She knew. And don't give me the shit that she didn't have the power, that he was more powerful than her. She was Meryl fucking Streep. She has like a couple Oscars and shit like that. And she's got her, her reputation spit-shined and polished brightly, right? She could have said whenever she wanted to that the guy was a fucking pig. Did she? Fuck no. Fucking hypocrite. Fucking cunt. Because now, now when it's easy, now when it doesn't cost her anything, now she's all over the fucking place. Fuck her. Well, and, and and that's the thing that bothers me. It is, you know, because it's there's a, there's a variety of reasons. Yeah, you're jumping on the bagwagon when it's safer, and and you know, there's either one of two things that are going on. Either you know, like you said, you're covering for the fact that you knew and you said nothing, or you're jumping on the bandwagon now. And to your point, she's Meryl Streep. It doesn't affect her one way or the other. You know, I would say it'd be even classier if she just said I had no comment on it at all, because she could just say, you know, what the fuck am I adding to it? Right. Uh, but no, she has to be a part of it. I'm like, why the fuck do you have to be a part of it? What more are you gonna get? Yeah. You know, yeah, that shit kind of. Uh, sorry, I I get it on a rant about that just stuff kind of too because I just there. It's the last crowd that should be talking about you know, and you know this that or the other. Into you know they're to use the Peterson metaphor. They're the the people with their house in the least order trying to tell other people how to keep their house in order. Yeah, I know it drives me off the fucking wall because if people that um, it, it's just bullshit. It's just fucking bullshit. That kind of hypocrisy. And, and it just it makes me it, it makes me so angry, okay? Because there is no doubt in my mind that if she had done the right thing, it, it, what do you think something's gonna happen to her fucking career? No fucking way, you know. I mean, she still would have been getting roles, you know, and she would have precisely, earned, yeah. Know, no, no, man. I mean, bullshit, bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, that's the thing, you know. It, it's look, I I suppose uh, my problem with Meryl Streep, and I, I can tell you right off the bat. All of my life, I've always swum against the current. Swam, swum, yes, swum. Uh, Swam's good. Yeah, let's uh, go with swum. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always gone against the current. I, I've never been the compliant little boy. You know, uh, you know, when I was in school, I'd just blow off classes when I wasn't interested and just pull out a book that I was interested in. And it wasn't like I was like you know, shooting spitballs and 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 playing in recess. No, I'd be reading shit that I found interesting. You know, I remember clearly blowing off history class to read the fucking Gulag Archipelago, you know, which is kind of weird if you think about it in, in the sense of like <laughs> fucking reading history in a history class I should have been paying attention to. But my, the point I'm trying to make is that, see, uh, I've always tried to be as forthright as possible and let the chips fall where they may. And I've never been the compliant boy. OK, I've always gone in, in the direction that I thought was the best. And so when these compliant people you know, the, the, the quote-unquote best and the brightest, the, the people who uh, sit quietly at the front of the uh, schoolroom, you know, and, and after they brought a shiny apple to the teacher, I always despised them. I always thought that they were fundamentally narcs. I, I always thought that they were fundamentally liars, okay? Uh, um, and I always thought fundamentally that they were people of low moral worth because that at the, at, at the moment of truth, morally speaking, they would always play it easy and play it safe and play it compliant, and they would always kowtow to power. And, and that's why I never liked them. And the fact is, you know, when this Harvey Weinstein thing finally came up and everybody was like outraged, and she was outraged among the most of them, you know, the loudest of them, I was like, what a fucking hypocritical cunt. I mean, yes. that, that's the thing. And, and that, that visceral rejection is because, see, I had to eat shit with my attitude, okay? Because an attitude like mine is, is you know, the non-compliant attitude. It, it's not a fun thing and not, not a fun way to live, right? And so I had to eat shit growing up. And, and even when I was an adult, you know, it, it wasn't a happy time to own my own conscience. But I own my own conscience. This woman... Nothing, and she gets accolades for it. I mean, I think that that's what pisses me off the most. And the, and the thing is, they're not. And you're right to say these are not unrelated issues. And I, I phrase it this way: 
has Meryl Streep ever given a performance that where you say that really challenges what I understand to be a great performance? It reveals something I'd never saw in a performance. No, no, no never. absolutely not. I got that with Jack. I got it with Clint. Yeah, I got it. You go through the great stars, even great uh, female stars. I mean, Catherine Hepper could do it. Audrey Hepper could do it. Um, even contemporary stars. I'd say Kathy Bates is, you know, can blow Meryl Streep out of the fucking water almost every time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, well, actually, yeah. I, I think that Catherine Hepburn is sort of like Meryl Streep. Well, the, the, she is a New Englander, but I think you know, uh, there's there's. Well, I'll tell you what I like about Catherine Hepburn. There's the the New England aristocratic, you know, go fuck yourself attitude, which I do kind of like. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit, you know. So she's probably like, you know, like the old stars like Cary Grant to say, you know, I've got a persona that I'm going to play a little bit. Uh, but I do, I do like her. But needless to say, there are there are plenty of people who really will challenge what you're doing at the performance here. Meryl Streep will do the best of the middle brow. She does it very well. Yeah, but it, that's but not a problem. no challenge. It's, 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 it's empty it, calories. Yeah, it's it's not even a problem of middle brow. No, and I I disagree. There could be middle brow pictures that have a lot of calories that can fill you up. Okay. I, I, I disagree on that. But the, the problem I have with, with Meryl Streep is that I, I don't want to say, that, well, that she's faking it, I guess. I guess, I guess that that's the thing. I look at these nice, compliant people, and I always suspect that they're faking it, you know? And, and I, I just <laughs> cannot fucking respect them. It's a, look, here, let me, let, me, let me expand on this issue of compliance or, or compliant people, right? It, it, it seems to me that there are some people who recognize that they are no good in uh, working and existing outside of a social structure. For example, uh, my brother-in-law, he's a very sharp customer, very, very smart man, business school, top of his class, just, just smart, brilliant, really. He tried to set up a small business on his own, and it didn't really work out. Not because he didn't give it his all, not because he made bad decisions. And in point of fact, it was sort of like puttering along. But he decided to get out of it because he realized that temperamentally he was unsuited for it. Okay, And it, this was a, a, a decision I respected him for because he realized that he was more comfortable and happier and more productive and more successful within a corporate structure. And, and, and that's who he is. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? So I'm not saying, you know, he, he, you know, all corporate people are bad. No, no, no. Some people are just temperamentally suited to that. Other people are temperamentally suited for being, you know, uh, uh, um, freelancers, for being on their own. They're, they're just like that, okay? And neither side, not, neither version is better or worse in a moral sense. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about that. I'm talking about the people who go along to get along, the people yeah. who surrender any kind of moral point of view and attitude for the sake of convenience and placating those they, they perceive as more powerful than themselves. Uh, uh, the, the people who are willing to stand by while, while immorality happens. Again, to go back to my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law had the opportunity to, he was, he was offered a great deal of money to go to work for another cor corporation. But he, you know, sniffed around and heard through the grapevine that he would essentially be expected to do things that he considered immoral. And they were objectively immoral and possibly illegal. And th that was just going to be part of doing business. And he decided, no, it would have meant a lot more money and, uh, you know, a lot more um, responsibility and perhaps like a gold star on his resume, as a matter of fact. But he realized that it wasn't that he was afraid of getting caught. His just sense of morality was such that he decided, no, that he didn't want and, to go in that direction. He sounds like the kind of guy who would have outed himself, by the way. You know, there are certain yeah. types of people who would have said, you know, when you put them in that situation, they will create a situation to reveal that this is wrong. Yeah, exactly. And so the, he, he just, no. And, and that was that, you know. I mean, and the guy is not lacking in ambition or anything like that, but his sense of morality was such that, no, that's just outside of my scope and I'm not going to do it. And that is a respectable decision. That is something that you can respect as a man. But how can you respect somebody who is saying, well, you know, it's good for my resume and I I'll get along, so I won't talk about that man who's sort of important, who's like, you know, forcing girls to get on their knees and suck him off. Oh, and now it's easy for me to do it? Oh, now I will. Uh, you see what I mean? I, I don't mean to harp on this, sh this issue, but it just seems to me like a key issue, a, a, a key, like, like, like a fatal flaw, and, and it, it's, it's revelatory, revelatory, rather, 
It, it, does this make any sense at all? It does. And I would, uh, and, you know, to the extent to which I'm going to keep it in her acting, I would say everything, because I do think those are related. It's a, it's a manifestation of ironically not being a hero of her craft. She betrayed her craft uh, because she has talent, uh, but she chose instead to, like you said, hey, you know, look, uh, almost like, you know, the dog that does the trick because they know the treat's coming attitude. Yeah. It feels like that's yeah. the case there. And, you know, the, and, the, and the dog will always lick your hand yes, if exactly. you feed him a treat and pet him or pet her. And, the thing, and the, here's the thing that good kind of, bitch, yeah. good <laughs> little Merrill the bitch. Yeah. Sorry about that. I couldn't resist. It's okay. It's 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 the right. That's the right use of the word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, here's the thing that gets me. And you, look, you you were in the town. You can tell it better than I have. People seem to be genuinely convinced that she's hot shit. Is are people lying to themselves? Do they really believe it? What's the deal with that? Because to me, oh, it that's seems easy. That's, that's discussed is obvious. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, it's like we're we're looking at it from a more nuanced position, and also we're not we're not. Um, when you're in the presence of somebody famous, in the direct presence of somebody famous, they tend to warp reality around you. And you tend to think that they're better, sleeker, cooler than they actually are. Because they've, they've occupied a mental space, a fairly large mental space. And th when you actually see them in person, it's like, whoa, whoa, Nelly, right? Uh, you and I who are a bit more distant, and also you and I who are a bit more thoughtful in terms of what is actually good and what is you know, superficially good, but not actually good, not actually difficult. Uh, uh, we, we have a different appreciation for it, okay? Um, it, it's just, frankly, it's, it's just an issue of being smarter and paying more attention. Because the thing is, see, our perspective, okay, right now is not a popular one, okay? But you see, our perspective is the one that history will render. And, and uh, because we're smarter, it's the bottom line. We're smarter than the aggregate of uh, who have an opinion on um, on Meryl Streep, and I don't mean that in a, like a self congratulatory sense. I'm just saying, like objectively, this is the case, and therefore I'm we, we see. I'm envisioning the memes of us sitting uh, on our brains coming out of our heads yeah. <laughs> on this one. No, no, uh, uh, no but, but, say, but you see what I'm saying. Say I, I know it sounds it. bullshitty. I, I know, I know, it sounds like I'm full of myself. I'm not saying it like I'm full of myself. I'm simply saying that we are anticipating what the historic consensus will be, you know, 30 years after Meryl Streep's death. But what we're talking about now, that's what people are going to be saying 30 years after her death, and it will be the conventional wisdom. Just as right now, the conventional wisdom is that she is the greatest uh, actress ever. Who was the first winner of the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature? Pop quiz. Who was the first winner? Was it um, Leo Tolstoy, who was alive? Author of um, uh, 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 what you call it, uh, War and Peace, and 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 Anna Karenina, two of the possibly greatest novels ever written, back to back, right? Uh, and Kreutzer Sonata and all the rest of it. Uh, Mark Twain, did he win it? No. Uh, Anton Chekhov, did he win it? No. Who won it? Sully Prudhomme. I, I I know this because you know it's it was so shocking that I was like had to find out. You know, Sully Prudhomme was this at the time a very very quote unquote important French author. Today, nobody's ever heard of the fucking guy. He's a nobody. He was less than middle brow. But at the time, he impressed the right people. Ditto with Meryl Streep. Right now, she has impressed the right people. She's got all this, these nominations and all the rest of it. She has fooled people because she's the brightest girl in the class. She has fooled the collective teachers, you know, the collective authority figures, into thinking that what she's doing is actually good acting when it's not. It's just like you said before, it's just a lot of pancake makeup and a lot of ticks that, that she tries to put in all these details instead of the single line that expresses what's really going on the way Clint Eastwood does. You see what I mean? Yeah, and I get, yeah, you know, I do. And I, I guess, the, you know, the, the reason I kind of take it back is I don't feel particularly more observant or prescient uh, over it. I think it's self apparent. I think uh, my guess is a lot of people must intuit it somehow so i don't yeah. think i'm special by knowing it but i, I just you know i think you, you probably do so you have a point everybody's just it's you say it enough times people believe it, it yeah well, well yeah, yeah 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 i say the lie enough times and people think it's the truth yeah who said that gibbles but um yeah exactly yeah, no but but insofar as she's concerned yeah because she impressed big directors early in her career okay and, and she convinced them because she was the brightest girl in the class, just as she convinced her teachers at her private school in Summit, New Jersey, and then at Vassar, and then at Yale Drama. 
she she actually works hard because all of these performances take a lot of work. Nobody's doubting her her work ethic, okay? And I, I don't think that she's phoning in, in by the way, uh, to answer your previous question. I think that she genuinely thinks that she's doing great work, okay? So it's not that she she's like fooling people, okay? I think that she's the last person on earth who has that uh, imposter syndrome. I think that she genuinely believes that she is the greatest actress because she's doing all this stuff. She doesn't mm, realize yeah. what great acting truly is, whereas Eastwood does, Nicholson does, uh, um, shit, Naomi Watts does, because they're true artists, and she's not. She's just, you know, a girl who wears a lot of pancake makeup and uh, has all these tics. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's it. Okay. So mm-hmm. I guess that... Um, you know, I guess that's the last that is, heaping of dirt the, over last, over Meryl Streep's Meryl corpse. Streep and it's <laughs> yes. all over. It's all over. Yeah, she can go home now. She's never going to act again, in, not in this town. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, yeah, so the, the extent to which we leave you with the little thoughts, uh, if you have the free time, I understand everybody's busy, so you don't have to follow up on it. Maybe you can find it on YouTube. Do take a, if you have a free moment. Look, you can look at the bridges of Madison County or the two films she made with Jack Nicholson. Go to a few scenes where she's interacting with them. Yeah. You'll see exactly what we're saying. Yeah, I, I actually think that the bridges of Madison County, uh, minor and trivial picture overall. I think it's actually the the best example of that distinction between great acting, truly great acting, uh, on the part of Clint Eastwood because he plays somebody that we've never seen before, and. Uh, Meryl Streep's overacting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is Coach Red Pill, and uh, this has been the Coach and Benway podcast. Mr. Dr. Benway? I hope you like us. You really, really like us. That's another <laughs> actress we should talk about. <laughs> yeah, so Just look it, up, look it up, everyone. You'll see what I'm referencing. <laughs> Till next time, all the best. All right, bye.